a session on the democracy and civic space in the world. So welcome to the session Gwangju Democracy Forum. My name is Axel Bong Lee. I'm the advisor to the Asian Foundation. At the same time, I'm the regional coordinator of APSD, Asia Civil Society Partnership for Sustainable Development. And also, I have many other heads, like advisor to many democracy organizations. So thank you for joining our session. Let me introduce briefly about our session. So this is a one of 26 parallel sessions during Gwangju Democracy Forum uh, for this week. Yesterday, we had an official ceremony, not if yesterday. At the same time, award giving ceremony for Gwangju Democracy, uh, Gwangju Prize for Human Rights. And today's session is about democracy and civic space. But yesterday and also this morning, there are a lot of sessions about democracy in Asia, Myanmar, many other issues. But today's session is global one, you know, democracy and civic space. So we have uh, two uh, speakers, two presentations, one uh, international idea and also civic goals. And we have uh, five speakers from different perspectives, uh, two international, one regional, and also global. Um, so uh, we have about 15, 20 minute presentation about civic space and democracy and about five to 10 minutes uh, uh, discussion. And then hopefully we have uh, some time for, for Q&A. You know? As you know, Gwangju Democracy Forum and 41 years ago, there was a big uh, democratic uprising and then over 200 people were killed by military in 1980. And after decade of struggle, Finally, the struggle recognized as a legitimate democratic uh, uh, struggle, and there was a compensation and reparation and the justice. You know, so now, Gwangju Memorial Foundation wants to uh, organize this type of forum to share the experience and also to support other democratic struggle, particularly this year in Myanmar and many others. But this session is beyond Asia globally because. Democracy uh, regression and shrinking speak space is a global phenomenon. So we want to address this issue and how we can work together uh, more uh, globally. Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce um, Sima Shah. She's from International Idea. As you know, International Idea headquarters in Stockholm, but she's in Amman. You know? We are working these days remotely. And you have about 15, 20 minutes for presentation, Sima. Are you ready? So we'll upload your PowerPoint, right, Sima? I'm ready. Yeah, okay. Yes, please. Okay, we'll do that, yeah. Okay, please start. Sure, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sima Shah, as, um, as was already said, I'm, I'm representing inter International IDEA. I'm the head of our Democracy Assistance Program, um, headquartered in Stockholm. Could you go to the next slide, please? So we at International IDEA produce what's known as the Global State of Democracy Report, which will be launched uh, in November of this year. This report provides a global health check of democracy around the world and for each broad region of the world. Our regions are divided into Africa and the Middle East, Europe, the Americas, and Asia and the Pacific. The statistical data that we rely on comes from our own global state of democracy indices, and we develop these based on our definition of democracy, which is um, broken up into two parts. One is popular control over decision-making, and the second is political equality in the exercise of that control. We then take these principles and translate them into five core attributes of democracy, which are the large circles that you see here, and which IDEA believes are the key elements of healthy democracies. First is representative government, which focuses on free and fair elections and free political parties. Second is fundamental rights. Then we have formal checks on government, impartial administration, which includes the absence of corruption, and participatory engagement, which focuses on citizen participation through civil society and in national and local elections. Each attribute is assigned a score from zero to one, with one being the highest performing. Right now, our indices cover about 163 countries. And I'd be happy to talk about more about the indices later if you are interested. Next slide. 
Another key data source for ideas analysis during the pandemic is our new COVID-19 Global Monitor. This is what we like to think of as a one-stop shop uh, online monitoring tool of how the COVID-19 measures adopted by countries around the world have impacted democracy and human rights in these countries. It's aimed to inform policymakers, civil society, and journalists, along with um, academics and students. There are 162 country profiles in the monitor with information on the impact of COVID-19 measures, like I said, on democracy and human rights, according to 29 aspects of democracy in the global state of democracy framework. And these 29 aspects are basically sub attributes of the five core attributes that I just listed. We also have a three level monitoring tool that identifies measures and actions taken that are either concerning or potentially concerning, concerning from a democracy and human rights perspective. Next slide. Uh, sorry, you're on the correct slide. So this is the website, which um, on the left here, you can go to the next slide, sorry. You can see it in a bigger format. This is the website. If you go and you're interested in seeing the, the COVID-19 monitoring tool, you'll be able to see the world map on the landing page. And then the countries are classified according to if there's a concerning development or a development to watch. And if you click on any of the countries, you'll be taken to a country profile where you can find information regarding how the country has been doing since the beginning of the pandemic. And you can also click on the country and region profiles and search for your country of preference if you wish to. Next slide. So today I'm gonna to start by outlining some of the pre-pandemic trends that we saw um, uh, when the pandemic hit, hit us. So first of all, since 2012, the number of countries with at least one statistic, statistically significant decline in any of the indicators of democratic quality has risen sharply since about 2015. And when the pandemic started, they outnumbered the countries with democratic advances. The declines have affected both democratic and non-democratic regimes. Since around 2010, the number of non-democratic regimes have become more, that have become more repressive has increased by about 40%, further closing the little democratic space that they had. This now affects more than a third of all non-democratic regimes. At the top of that list are Turkey, Nicaragua, Burundi, Venezuela, and Cambodia. Next slide. The second trend is that since 2012, there's also been a continuous increase in the number of democracies suffering from democratic erosion, which increased more than threefold between 2012 and 2019. When we say democratic erosion, we're talking about a loss of democratic quality within democracies, which we observe through a statistically significant decline in any of the indicators of democratic quality over the last five years. For the first time since 2019, the majority of democracies, so about 52%, are now suffering some kind of democratic erosion. Erosion can occur at different levels of development and with different levels of severity. In 2019, nearly half of the world's population lived in countries that experienced some form of democratic erosion. In 2019, severe democratic erosion, countries with declines on three or more aspects of democracy, affected Brazil, the Philippines, Poland, and the United States as the four countries in the world with the greatest declines in the five years prior to the outbreak of the pandemic. Countries that have experienced erosion so severe that they lost their democratic status were Honduras, which turned into a hybrid regime in 2017, and Benin in 2019. Democratic backsliding was also on the increase, on the rise before the pandemic. When we say backsliding, we mean a particular and often more severe form of erosion defined as the intentional and often very gradual weakening of checks on government and clamp down on civil liberties by democratically elected governments. The average length of backsliding was nine years. In 2019, countries with the most severe backsliding were Hungary, Poland, India, Brazil, Serbia, and the Philippines. Next slide. Despite these concerning trends, there was also another side to the pre-pandemic democracy narrative. Even though the democratic expansion had slowed compared to the early 1990s until the pandemic hit, 
democracy did continue to expand, including to countries that had never experienced democracy before. So in 2015, Burkina Faso, which had been a hybrid regime for 22 years, transitioned to democracy for the first time. In 2018, Malaysia and Armenia transitioned to democracy for the first time in their histories after being hybrid regimes for the past decades. Sri Lanka in 2015 and the Gambia in 2017 were hybrid regimes that re-transitioned back to democracy. Next slide. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected those trends? Next slide, please. So I'm going to um, present some findings, but I'd like to caution you that these findings are based on data that um, uh, what is relevant only up to the end of 2019. Our 2020 data is coming out as of June 1st. So this is what we, what we project, but some of the figures might be um, a little bit approximate at this stage. So first, what we saw is that 59% of countries in the world declared a national state of emergency or similar measure in response to the pandemic. By mid-December 2020, over half of those countries had actually lifted their state of emergency status, although many had have since then had to reimpose them or extend them because of the fluctuating nature of the virus. Next slide. Because of the endurance of the pandemic, like I said, some of those states of emergency have been reinstated. The average length of pandemic states of emergency is about seven and a half months. That figure is based on 77 countries that we have data for on the start and end dates of those states of emergency. Also, it should be taken into account that Egypt and Tunisia have had states of emergency since 2017 and 2015 respectively. And since 2020, they have been ex expanding them or extending them due to COVID. 96 countries around the world declared pandemic related states of emergency and they were more, more common in democracies. So 72% of democracies compared to 47% of hybrid regimes and 33% of authoritarian regimes declared states of emergency. Next slide. More than half of the countries covered in the global monitor they had implemented measures to curb COVID-19 or experienced developments during the pandemic that presented concerns from a democracy and human rights perspective with a clear transgression of democratic standards because they were either disproportionate, illegal, indefinite, or unnecessary in relation to the health threat. So a lot of the way that we measure whether, whether states of emergency or responses in general are concerning is whether uh, the response is proportionate to the risk posed by the pandemic. Next slide. Not surprisingly, developments of concern from a democracy and human rights perspective have been more common in non-democracies than in democracies. Such developments occurred in 94% of authoritarian regimes, 83% of hybrid regimes, and 43% of democracies. While it, it isn't surprising necessarily that authoritarian and hybrid regimes were more likely to, severe, to severely curtail basic freedoms and rights with or without a pandemic, the fact that more than two out of five democracies has had at least one concerning development is a cause for concern. Next slide. The democracies that have experienced concerning developments from a democracy and human rights perspective are those that were already ailing before the pandemic. So 71% had already been experiencing problems. And I've listed um, the regions where the other 11 uh, in that list were. Next slide. As we've all seen around the news, there's also been an increase in the use of arbitrary arrests and excessive, use, excessive force by security agencies as the pandemic has proceeded and as publics have become more and more impatient with lockdowns and other restrictions. Next slide. Concerning measures to enforce COVID-19 regulations have been more than twice as common in non-democratic regimes. In at least 32 countries, the military has been called in to enforce the regulations. And in at least 85 countries, excessive police force has been used to enforce the regulations. This has been more common in hybrid regimes in 70% of them than in democracies. Compulsory contact tracing apps were more common in authoritarian regimes than in democracies. Although even there, um, 
only 18% of, of authoritarian regimes made it mandatory and 6% of democracies made it mandatory. Next slide. At least 89 countries have passed laws or taken actions to restrict the freedom of expression. The argument has often been combating disinformation on the virus. Actions have included the harassment or detention of journalists, news outlets, citizens, activists, or opposition politicians. In Asia and Pacific, we've seen the highest share of countries where actions to restrict the freedom of expression have been deemed concerning during the pandemic, according to our monitor. However, these actions have occurred across all the regions in the world. The actions to restrict the freedom of expression on the virus or efforts to conceal data on the virus has been roughly 1.5 times more common in non-democratic regimes than in democracies. Next slide. Over 75% of all elections postponed during COVID-19 were postponed in the spring and summer of 2020. Democracies and hybrid regimes were more likely to postpone their elections than authoritarian regimes. The Middle East region was the region with the largest share of postponed elections during this period, with 60% of countries affected. Next. The, democ the democratization process that seemed promising prior to the outbreak of the pandemic has either been halted, strained, or reversed in some cases. So in halted democratization, democratization we've seen as an example Ethiopia, which improved from an authoritarian to a hybrid regime in 2015 and had scheduled its first multi-party competitive elections for 2020. Those were postponed for almost a year, now scheduled to be held in June of this year due to the pandemic and increasing conflict. In terms of strained democracies, we've seen lots of examples, but one that stands out is Bolivia. After flawed elections in 2019, Bolivia held free and fair elections at the end of 2020, putting the country back on a democratic path. However, the country has been plunged into severe political crisis since this year with arrests of members of the transition government by the new administration on charges of terrorism, demonstrating the fragility of Bolivia's democracy and its compromised judicial system. We've also seen complete reversals in Mali, for example, which held challenging elections in 2020 with parts of the country banned from voting due to insurgencies and the leader of the opposition kidnapped a few days prior. The military took over power in August of 2020 in that country. Next slide. Finally, as we all know, women have been disproportionately affected by the consequences of the pandemic. Women all over the world are facing increased levels of domestic violence, care duties, unemployment, and poverty. Lockdowns have increased gender-based violence, and women's economic and productive lines have been disproportionately disrupted by the consequences of the pandemic. Globally, women aged between 25 and 34 are more likely than men to live in extreme poverty. The COVID-19 crisis has increased the impact on women, according to the United to the United Nations, 247 million women will be living on less than two US dollars per day this year compared with 236 million men. Uh, next slide. To conclude, the concerning democratic deterioration observed prior to the pandemic has deepened during the pandemic. The promising dem democratization processes have been severely strained and in some cases reversed citizen movements for democratization have been violently quenched in some cases. The economic crisis will likely lead to more dissatisfaction, which can add strain to already challenged contexts. However, despite these concerning tendencies, there are some rays of hope. Democracies coped. If anything, this pandemic has shown us that democracies can cope with the pandemics while still preserving many freedoms and rights, even if some of those have been restricted during the pandemic time. Although some countries, notably New Zealand, Taiwan, and Finland, have done particularly exceptional jobs keeping freedoms open and keeping the democratic space open. We've seen democratic innovation, particularly in elections, with the increased use of special voting arrangements, which we hope will stay around and will ena enable people to vote in a more flexible manner. We've seen that parliaments and political parties have also found new ways to operate through digital means, which will hopefully lead to more and better participation. We've seen increased digitization, which has pushed the boundaries for how political processes can become more inclusive, participatory, and cost efficient. 
And we've seen new democratic openings. We saw protests, which at first targeted measures against the pandemic, turn into larger full-blown movements for democracy. Next slide, please. We have a few very um, preliminary conclusions. One is that the pandemic has put democracy under more serious stress, which deserves attention. It has accelerated, in some cases, the deterioration process of democratic freedoms. The crisis has halted democratic openings in some cases. And in other cases, new opportunities to advance and improve have emerged. Next slide. What political developments will remain once the pandemic subsides? Well, we think, as, we, as I noted, in, with regard to elections, special voting arrangements and other special um, polling station arrangements will hopefully continue. Electoral campaigns will change. Again, when we think about um, the move to online campaigning and the use of digital tools, some executive powers will remain, um, especially as the pandemic fluctuates over time. And there will be more emphasis on strong state capacity. One of the things we've seen is that different democracies and non-democracies have had very different levels of resilience in the face of the pandemic, and people are demanding that their states do more. Um, and then finally, in conclusion, um, we've seen that, that the pandemic has put us democracies and non-democracies um, under serious stress, which will need attention. And the real danger lies ahead. Um, how states and governments deal with the fallout from the economic crisis will determine um, how resilient democracies and non-democracies are and how public, satisfa public satisfaction with their governments will either strengthen um, or reverse in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Asma. I think this is a um, very good uh, basis for other, our further reflection and discussion. And short, um, your report was mentioned by the political parties in South Korea. They created a debate you know, about democracy and COVID-19 in South Korea and also many others. So in this sense, I think your, the, this research outcome was really timely and provided a really good opportunity on the thank you. implication of COVID on uh, democracy. So I want to thank you once again you know, for your hard work to produce an uh, excellent uh, Thank you. So let's move to the next one. So now we are uh, getting close to the civic space. You know? So first, the team was the overall democratic situation, but now let's get closer to what's happening in the civic space. So we have also another excellent report from Civic Coast. It's not only this year, but last several years. So please, um, uh, Ine, Sibirin, please give us uh, your view. What's happening in the civic space uh, last year, particularly this year on the um, coronavirus? Are you in now Johannesburg, South Africa, Ine? How is the situation in South Africa now? So Sorry? how is the coronavirus situation in South Africa? Uh, they're expecting a third wave now. A third wave, man. Huh? I hope you are OK, you know? Okay, please, you have about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, can you start the, uh, the slides? Uh, can you yourself or shall I help you? Shall I upload uh, our side, the PowerPoint? Can you? You can do yourself, yes. Okay, yeah, very good. Okay, yeah, we can see it uh, in the screen. Very good morning, everyone. I know for most of you, it's a good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Ina Van Sebre, and I work for the Civicus Monitor. And in particular, I, um, I cover um, Central and West Africa for the Monitor. Um, so today I'm just gonna, uh, present our reports that we published in December. Um, it's our people power under attack reports. It's our annual uh, reports on the state of civic space um, around the world. So it, for those who don't know the Civicus Monitor, we're an online platform um, 
that uses different information sources. And we work with over 20 um, regional research partners. Um, and all that comes together into a rating system. So we, we rate civic space um, going from open, the best rating, to narrowed, obstructed, repressed, and closed. Um, we define um, civic space as um, we cover freedom of peaceful assembly, so the freedom to um, protest, uh, freedom of expression, um, freedom of association, and then um, the state's duty to um, protect. So globally, um, only um, 3.4% percent of the world population live um, in countries where civic space um, is open. Um, I think the majority, 87 percent of the population live in, um, in um, countries where civic space is severely restricted. Um, Ine, either please click for the next slide, next the first page. Please click for the next slide. Oh, I see Just the third one. Uh, so in my screen, see the first page. Um, I see the third one, so I, I'm not sure what's wrong. What about other speaker? Can you see the first page or third one, page three? My screen. Is I see only the title page. Yeah, that's why, you know? Please check. Wait, let me stop sharing and do it again. Yes, please. Okay. What do you see now? The front page, the first page. No, I see the other page. I don't know what, what is wrong. Are you in present mode? Sometimes that makes a difference. Where do I find present mode? Um, if you go up to slideshow and you say, it should give you an option there. Because what we see is the, the, the tiles on the left as well as the thing in the middle. It's not showing as if you're presenting. Oh yeah, now? it's better now, it's okay. Yeah, that could work. Yes, yes, yes. I was talking about the global snapshot. Um, so 80, 70, 87% uh, of the world population live in the worst categories, which is obstructed, repressed, and closed. Uh, what we've seen is that more and more countries um, have moved, um, and that's not a trend that is new this country, uh, this year. Uh, it was last year as well. They're moving towards obstructed and repressed categories. Um, so we see the, the civic space condition uh, declining uh, year by year. Um, the only category where um, uh, that has lessened is the closed um, category. Um, that is mainly because two countries have upgraded from closed to repressed, and these are um, DRC and Sudan. Oh, this is the wrong um, presentation, sorry. This is the Africa one. Sorry, <laughs> I did a presentation last week. Um, Big time, you know, we have always technical challenges you know, when you do the Zoom. This is the wrong one. Let and speaker, it. we have your PowerPoint while waiting for her to fix the problem. So you can read your own PowerPoint. Meanwhile, as you see, um, the international idea, they have five categories, high performance, mid performance, low, hybrid, and authoritarian. Uh, civicals have a five categories with the different names. Um, 
open, narrow, obstructed, depressed, and closed. You know? So they're very similar. And also, as you know, there is another democracy index by the economists. They have also the five categories. You know? So these are the three international democracy index, which can be um, compared internationally. And uh, but this time we invite only two international idea and civic groups, which because and also as you know there is another one by freedom freedom house so there are many international data which we can use for international analysis which can be very important for civic society uh, cso advocacy on democracy and civic space oh now it's okay okay Ina, you can continue i'm so sorry about this no, no um, so, um we downgraded 11 countries um, which kind of indicates um, the downward um, trend and only two countries have upgraded um, this year. Um, in the Americas, um, Costa Rica went from open to narrowed um, mainly because of uh, legislation restricting um, the freedom of peaceful assembly and um, indigenous defenders being attacked. And then in Chile, Ecuador, and USA, they all experienced mass pro protest movements that were um, repressed um, by um, authorities. Then in Africa, um, there were quite a lot of uh, downgrades uh, in West Africa in particular, which is a subregion of um, concern. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Guinea, um, Niger and Togo, and since yesterday um, Benin was added, also from obstructed to repressed. All these five countries had elections um, in uh, 2020, problematic um, uh, elections in some of the countries' presidents uh, went beyond their um, constitutional two-term limit. Um, so yeah, now Benin uh, that had elections, uh, legislative elections in April 2019 and um, recently presidential elections, they are now uh, also downgraded um, from obstructed to repressed. And that is a year after Nigeria and two years after Senegal went from narrowed um, to um, obstructed. Um, Sudan and DRC had upgrades from close to repressed. Um, this more reflects um, uh, a change in, in regime um, that both had, have experienced, although um, a lot, there was a lot of hope um, and uh, a lot needs to be done um, to keep that um, upgrade. Um, then the Asia, Asia Pacific, um, the Philippines went from obstructed um, to repressed. This is due to the attacks on HRTs and journalists, the vilification and criminalization of activists, uh, assaults on press freedom, uh, and a new draconian anti-terror law. Then Europe um, and so um, Europe is also Europe is home to um, the best civic space ratings, um, open and narrowed. Uh, although they're also on a downward um, spiral, um, and uh, Slovenia um, was downgraded from open to narrowed. Um, and as uh, the colleague from I ID already um, mentioned, Poland and Hungary are quite problematic um, in Europe. Um, on the bright side. Austria in October 2020, uh, they moved from uh, narrowed um, back to open. Then the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, in that region, um, Iraq was um, uh, downgraded from repressed and closed. Um, that has to do with the mass protest movements um, that was um, repressed by um, authorities. Then the top 10 violations. Um, the, the first one is um, the detention of protests. Um, um, so 2019 was a year of protests. Um, now 2020, even with um, COVID-19, uh, with the pandemic, um, it was still um, a year of protests um, with a lot of people demanding political and structural change. Uh, for example, Chile, Hong Kong, USA, Nigeria, um, 
um, and um, yeah, a lot of protests also went to online spaces or um, new creative forms of protesting um, in um, during the pandemic. Um, it's a bit ironic that the detention of protesters is the number one violation in the year of COVID-19. Um, so um, yeah, because often the detention of protesters, um, putting them in, in often overcrowded prisons, um, it's a bit ironic um, that the authorities um, have resorted to, the, to that. Um, the detention of protesters, it's, uh, you can see number nine, um, the excessive use of force, they often go um, side by side. Um, it's not new, we also uh, had that in 2019. Um, the only change is that COVID-19, the pandemic kind of gave um, governments uh, a, a pretext uh, to ban protests or uh, to restrict um, uh, the freedom of um, peaceful assembly. Um, then um, uh, censorship, uh, the number three violation that often goes side by side um, with harassment and intimidation um, and um, attacks on journalists and uh, activists. Um, so um, we call it an information blockade, um, which had, has worsened um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so um, that has been used as a pretext as well um, to silence um, activists, dissent for forces, and to restrict ac access to information. Um, we've seen in several countries where access to information on the pandemic has been restricted. Um, maybe um, under censorship, um, for example, um, some worst cases were China um, that has censored um, information on um, COVID-19 um, and social media posts, posts even early in the pandemic, uh, even from you know families that were reaching out um, because of uh, families of, of people who were infected who were reaching out on social media to get information or help. Um, in Tanzania, um, Tanzania is a country that uh, actually uh, stopped uh, publishing information on COVID-19 since uh, April um, 2020. Um, it's one of the countries where um, uh, COVID-19, where, where the government denied COVID-19 was in the country and um, media outlets and journalists who reported on COVID-19, um, they were either um, suspended, arrested, um, and then Turkey is also, um, it already had uh, quite um, a lot of restriction on freedom of uh, expression. Um, and uh, they have inspected more than 6,000 social media posts in, um, during the start of the pandemic um, and uh, have adopted a restrictive law on uh, social, um, social media. Um, then another trend is um, countries that have adopted laws or policies and regulations that criminalize uh, free speech under um, disinformation, disinformation laws or um, laws on fake news. Um, this, this happens a little bit across the board uh, because it also happened in countries, uh, for example, Botswana, which has a civic space rating um, uh, of narrows and even South Africa, they have uh, adopted such um, uh, regulations. Um, then, um, yeah, some countries such as Singapore and uh, Ethiopia already had um, that kind of a loss um, on disinformation. Um, they just, um, with, the, with the pandemic, they have increased it increasingly used um, that um, to crack down on, um, on people and uh, free speech. Then another um, aspect of censorship is um, um, internet shutdowns. Um, we, we see that uh, often happening, um, and especially I work on, on um, uh, Africa. Uh, I've seen that increasingly happen in, in, in the context of elections or uh, when ma mass protests are taking place. Um, some of the countries that have done that in 2020 are Bangladesh, uh, Ethiopia, India, and Guinea. Um, some um, 
uh, regional differences, so uh, restrictive restrictive laws um, on, on uh, freedom of expression or peaceful assembly. Um, that is, um, uh, for the Asia and Pacific, that is the most common violation. Um, for the Americas, it's intimidation and harassment of activists. Um, then in, Af uh, in Africa, it is detention of journalists. Um, in the MENA region, it's censorship. And in uh, Europe and Central Asia, it's uh, the detention of protesters. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ine. So it was so very interesting. Uh, let me check once again. I see uh, in Asia Pacific, Taiwan is only open. And then we have uh, several countries West. Uh, Europe, and this is the only country that are open, right? This is none, none of them in the uh, uh, Americas. Am I right? This, I couldn't find any in the open democracy, Middle East, Africa. Uh, no, 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 so North America. Well, I must, I must say some of the um, smaller nations, uh, the island states, you can't really see them on the map. Um, so in yes. Africa, there are two um, two countries with an open open space rating. Okay. That is um, Sao Tome and Principe and uh, Cape Verde, but it's I difficult see. to spot them on the map. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. I'll find it in the bigger map. Okay. Thank you very much for another excellent presentation. It's an overview of civic space. So now let's start our discussion. So we have about five panelists. The first two are global. And as you know, there are two intergovernmental organizations on democracy. One is the international idea, the other one is a community of democracy. And I remember 2000, year 2000, the Community Democracy Summit was held in South Korea, you know. And so I'm very familiar with the Community Democracy. And then second speaker will be from the civil society, uh, aimed for as the Action for Sustainable Development, which is a global platform for action on sustainable development goal. As you know, sustainable SDG bring as a, like a convergence of all different sectors, not, not only the traditional sustainable development group, but also human rights, democracy, and so on. So we want to look at the state of democracy and civic space from these two angles, intergovernmental and then civil society. Then we'll go to Haspa today in India, largest democracy in the world, you know, but now was pandemic several years ago it was in the United States but now in India then we'll go to Asia and the final will be uh, Professor Bang Myung Nim he's an academic and they will give us from academic point of view how do we understand you know this global phenomenon and the, what are the implications and ways forward okay so this is a composition of five the panelists let's begin with uh, Patricia Almedes from Community Democracy you have about seven eight minutes please Patricia Thank you, Anselmo, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the Guangzhou Democracy Forum. I'm very happy to be here today um, and uh, be able to speak a, a bit, really, this morning, actually, this afternoon for all of you on the community of democracies and the importance of strengthening democracy and supporting civil society. But let me begin uh, by giving a, a brief overview of the community of democracies. It was founded in the year 2000 as a global intergovernmental coalition, and it's comprised of governing council member states that support adherence to common democratic values and standards outlined in the Warsaw Declaration. The Warsaw Declaration is the founding document of the community of democracies and was adopted in June 2000 by representatives of 106 states. The Declaration's 19 principles defined the essential norms and practices for the effective establishment and consolidation of democracy. Among these are free and fair elections, freedom of opinion and expression, which is principle four, the right of the press to collect, report, and disseminate information, news, and opinions, the right of freedom of peaceful assembly and association, the obligation of the elected government to refrain from extra constitutional actions, that government institutions be transparent, participatory, and fully accountable to the people. This is just to name a few. I'm not going to list them all. And you can actually find them in uh, the Community of Democracies website. 
The community currently has 29 governing council member states from different regions of the world. The Republic of Korea is uh, one of them. The Republic of Korea is actually a member of the executive committee, uh, committee of the community of democracies and a very active member of the community. The organization is unique since its membership is global, uh, but it's not based on geographical, linguistic, or economic criteria, but rather on the commitment of those shared values enshrined in the Warsaw Declaration. And, but there is also an added value to the community of democracies, which I think other organizations at the global level don't necessarily have. And that is that the community brings to democracy related debates, the participation of civil society. Civil society is indispensable to ensuring resilient democracies. Only with access to free and safe civic space can people communicate their interests, raise public concern about any abuses of power, exercise their rights, and fully take part in decision-making processes in their countries. Since its establishment, the community of democracies has repeatedly affirmed and maintained its commitment to engage the civil society in all aspects of governance and development. In effect, this relationship between democracy and civil society is one of deep-rooted synergy. The community of democracies acknowledged this in the Warsaw Declaration, as well as in various declarations made at the community's ministerial meetings. Um, and further, also in the civil society standards, where member states of the community recognize the importance of a robust civic space in an enabled and empowered civil society. Now, under the 2018-2023 strategic plan of the community of democracies, civil society continues to play uh, and be an important partner for the community of democracies in moving forward with the strategic objectives and the activities that we do. The community works together with civil society in, and its representative in community by the International Steering Committee of the Civil Society Pillar. This is composed of global, regional, and sometimes national level organizations. Actually, Civicus is part of the ISC of the Civil Society Pillar, and so is Asia Democracy Network, um, which are here present today. The community engages with civil society, like I said, in all areas of work, including democracy and development, youth engagement, and in supporting democratic consolidation and transitioning countries. Actually, just recently during missions that were held by the community of democracies to transitioning countries, um, we had meetings also with civil society. And these meetings helped us understand democracy challenges countries are facing and how the community can best assist in this democratic transition. Almost 21 years later, after the establishment of the community, the principles of the Warsaw Declaration remain in place. Although the membership has changed, reflecting in many ways some of the challenges that have already been mentioned uh, this morning to democracy. And these challenges to democracy, of course, are many. They're both uh, you know, internal and external, such as um, a weak rule of law, corruption, um, shrinking of civic space mentioned by Civicus, and as also mentioned by the presentation of international idea, Pre-pandemic, this uh, number of countries experiencing democratic decline had risen, and so were the countries experiencing a decline in the quality of their democracy. Um, although I think it's very important to know from the presentations made that there were also countries experiencing a transition to democracy, as was mentioned um, by international idea, I think uh, Armenia, for example, and the Gambia, which are both both countries actually were visited uh, back in uh, 2019 and early in 2020 by the community of democracies. These challenges uh, to democracy that were clearly already present pre-pandemic were actually worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with democratic systems of governance that faced crisis of confidence from the electorate and also externally from authoritarian influences that many times exploited the crisis through disinformation and misinformation. Um, but I think it's important to note that crises often require, of course, extraordinary measures. And in 2020, as was mentioned before, decisions were taken by countries that placed limitations on fundamental freedoms, 
many of them putting in place states of emergency, as was mentioned. And, um, but in democracy, it's important to highlight that these actions should be measured by the principle of rule of law, including requirement of conformity with the constitution of all acts of public authorities. The Warsaw Declaration uh, addresses this issue of engaging in any extra constitutional actions in principle 13, which mentions that elected leaders should uphold the law and function strictly in accordance with the constitution and procedures established by the law. And of course, any limitations on rights imposed should be temporary and in accordance with the principles of legality, necessity, and proportionality. I think it's also important to note from the Civicus Monitor that civil society has continued pre-pandemic and now during the pandemic, uh, of doing a good job of monitoring these uh, restrictions imposed uh, due to the pandemic, including, of course, uh, the shrinking of civic space, as was presented by the Civicus Monitor, which I have to say provided a, a very alarming, actually, snapshot of the deterioration of civic space around the world and with now more people around the world living with significant civic space restrictions. Uh, but in this context, I think it's essential that democracies continue to lead by example and work together, um, maximizing joint efforts to deal with the crisis while ensuring that all human rights, civil, cultural, economic, political, and social can be promoted and protected. And I think as the world looks forward to building a better future after the pandemic, uh, we need to continue to address uh, these uh, important challenges that were mentioned today to democracy through dialogue and common action. This is something that the community continues to do in everything we do, the, you know, promoting dialogue and common action between democracies. We need inclusive dialogue, inclusive policies, and we need leaders that listen to the voice of all groups in society, including, of course, minorities and vulnerable groups. And more importantly, we need governments to be engaged in a dialogue with civil society, taking into account the perspectives of all stakeholders to develop this common approach to current issues and, and, find, and find common solutions. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. So we will take questions about what uh, community of democracy has been doing in response to the challenges from COVID-19. I'm wearing my scarf, it's a green. Today is a green color. Uh, yesterday I was a cemetery. It's a victim of course in Korea and said, the history I remember will repeat itself. You know? Because this is a stress the importance of remembering the history of people's uh, struggle, and just to show you know, I hope you can come to uh, Gwangju next time. Uh, uh, Patricia, you never been to Gwangju before, right? No, I have not. I have yeah. not. Let, let's hope okay. that after the pandemic we're able so, to do that. Remember, I we held uh, the first democracy forum back in 2019 in Busan. Uh, it was in Busan, yes, mm -hmm. right. You know, okay, so I hope you can come if, uh, when you know Corona is subsides. So mm -hmm. hopefully next year, and only two, you know, Sima and Ine, all of you, uh, you are welcome to Gwangju. I think uh, house tour were in Gwangju before, you know. Okay, so we can have a real more in depth discussion next year. Okay, let's move to the next speaker. Oli, you are based in London, right? So did you get? Thank you so much. Did you get back? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, not yet, not yet. Okay. Although uh, I think it's coming up in in the next month or so. I'm, uh, I wasn't in the high priority category, okay. uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there are others who who need it before me. Uh, okay. But yeah. uh, thank you so much, uh, Anselmo. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you uh, and with so many uh, colleagues uh, whose work I, I know and respect. Uh, we, we've worked, uh, I worked previously with Civicus um, and I've worked closely with you Anselmo, so it's wonderful to connect uh, the dots. Um, so I'm the coordinator at Action for Sustainable Development. Um, as you kindly mentioned Anselmo, we are a, a network for civil society to connect around the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Um, it came out of uh, the Action 2015 campaign where we had brought many voices of civil society into the negotiations on the SDGs um, and highlighted our priorities 
and how they should be included in the text of the SDGs. Um, and we now have more than 3,000 different groups, many of them national coalitions working on uh, accountability, um, looking at how governments are actually delivering on their commitments and their promises under all of the 17 goals, which you can see behind me here. And as you know, goal 16 in particular is a crucial one, uh, which includes a number of indicators around good governance um, and civic space. Um, so it's great to be able to join you and, and share a few reflections. Um, it's, it's a hard act to follow when we see the uh, the very detailed analysis has been provided by Civicus and IDEA, and thank you again for those. I, I guess what I would like to add um, in terms of reflections uh, from the kind of SDG lens um, is, as you know, one of the key principles of the goals um, that was agreed um, with, with all the UN member states is around leaving no one behind and ensuring that um, those who are furthest behind are the first to be um, helped and, and uh, to be supported. Um, and clearly with COVID, we're not seeing uh, that taking place. And I think many of the trends that have been described are very, very worrying. Um, I think it's interesting to note that with the impact of COVID, um, the uh, particular inequalities that were already there, so looking at goal 10, for example, and inequality, um, those have been much uh, more acutely demonstrated through the impact of the pandemic, where many of those communities that were already struggling and already in uh, fragile states are now pushed even further behind and are really uh, not being supported. And I count the UK government as one of those that has been uh, not uh, demonstrating solidarity in this, uh, in this moment of crisis. And we've seen, unfortunately, a rise of nationalism and uh, putting um, the, the national priorities above those of uh, international solidarity. Um, and in fact, the vaccine example that you just mentioned, and Selma is a good example where I find it shameful that the UK is stockpiling vaccines when there are many other countries that uh, have not even had access to vaccines for those who are most vulnerable and who need them most. And so I'm very much in favor of uh, what, what is called dose sharing and ensuring that the access to the vaccine is equitable and that all of those who need it um, receive it as soon as possible. Um, so I think health uh, inequalities underlie quite a lot of these other inequalities that we see. Um, and of course, health being goal three, that's another fundamental goal within the SDGs. And, and the principle of universal health coverage has really come through strongly from many of our coalitions and, and campaign partners that um, that needs to be an underpinning for uh, future demands and, and for the recovery. Secondly, the kind of economic impacts of the pandemic. So I think once we've seen the initial uh, health um, implications, we then see a longer tail of an economic impact, which is already uh, strongly felt in many countries where people have had to basically stop their uh, their production. They've had to reduce their ability to uh, receive funds and to distribute funds. They've had to um, cut uh, significant amounts of um, their, um, their, their, their activity. And so the impact of that is that many jobs are being lost, many people are being pushed into positions of greater poverty. Uh, and again, many of the larger donor countries like the UK and the US uh, are cutting their international uh, development finance at this crucial time, which again is completely the wrong way to go. Um, the UK, for example, at the moment has proposed reducing its ODA commitments down from the 0.7%, which had been agreed uh, back in 2015 and before, um, and is looking um, to reduce uh, international development assistance just at a time when so many countries need it even more. Um, so I think that is, again, the, the economic solidarity is crucial. We're also campaigning at the moment to ensure uh, access to additional funds through um, what's called the special drawing rights uh, at the IMF. So that would uh, effectively create new uh, funds that would be available to be transferred to least developed countries to ensure that they have um, support to be able to uh, rebuild and recover uh, strongly. Um, and, then, and then finally, I think there's the social dimensions of the impact. And, and we've heard already from many of the other speakers about um, the gender uh, inequalities um, and um, other key groups that are being uh, more mar further marginalized uh, in the current situation. So we think about 
persons with disabilities, uh, younger people who are particularly impacted by um, the way that they may not be able to interact with others, they may not be able to find opportunities because of the increasing lockdowns, they may not be able to uh, complete their education in, in some cases. So the social impacts as well of um, the pandemic and how those undermine the fabric of community living um, and the way that people have been used to interacting and having that day-to-day uh, engagement, much of that is being undermined um, at the moment as well. And, and I think all of that is then compounded by the examples that we've heard from today, where governments then, on top of all that, are using the pandemic as an excuse to say that they need to further uh, repress and further limit uh, people's rights to speak out. Uh, we've seen situations where people, particularly who are highlighting um, lack of health uh, access being targeted um, and shut down because the government doesn't want to be uh, seen to be criticized for not delivering on its health care and, and vaccine commitments. And so, again, uh, using the excuse of, um, you know, uh, public, uh, public um, challenge or using the excuse that this may be somehow betraying the national interest, um, they actually further repress um, people's voices. So um, it, is a, it is a very difficult situation. Um, on the other hand, one or two things that, that I hope might be um, ways forward for us as civil society and working with many others, I think that the digital engagement um, that a number of people have mentioned can offer some opportunities. I know that there are also restrictions to digital civic space, um, but we are seeing new ways of people organizing online. We do know that people are able to share their stories more immediately online. I've been talking recently to groups in the Amazon, for example, where they're looking at getting uh, cloud-based internet into some parts of the Amazon so that indigenous peoples are able to raise the alarm when uh, land, uh, land grabbers come into their territory, they're able to raise the alarm more quickly uh, via these online platforms. Um, we've also seen, I know of examples in, in Egypt and other places where people can use apps to raise um, concerns um, that they may be feeling um, that their uh, rights are being repressed. So, so there are some uh, opportunities there, I think, for us to work together using new technologies to, to raise awareness uh, more quickly. Um, and, and then finally, in terms of how we might work together, I think that solidarity between and across civil society is absolutely crucial at this time. Uh, one of the things that we are doing, um, you know, with you and Selma and with others, with colleagues at Civicus, is when a country is presenting um, what's called a voluntary national review, a VNR, um, on the Sustainable Development Goals, we can use that as one moment, one snapshot to put some pressure and to build coalitions uh, across civil society to highlight where some of those gaps are. Um, as you know, we call them scorecards or parallel reports where people are actually able to say, well, here are the gaps that we see in our country. We're not uh, willing to, to accept this and to actually speak out publicly, to use that international moment to raise awareness. And, and we know that the UN is also interested to help. Um, I've, I've been quite reassured by the language that we hear from Guterres as the SG uh, particularly highlighting human rights um, as an essential part of what the UN wants to champion. Um, so I think there are moments there where we can work together to uh, showcase and highlight where the challenges are um, and over time to build um, different ways of uh, supporting those, um, those individuals who are, who are directly under threat. Um, and, and I hope you know, we can also then identify new ways to uh, bring funding, bring support, uh, bring solidarity directly to those groups that are that are most um, directly threatened. Um, and I think you know that's one thing that we're looking at is whether there are some specific crowdfunding opportunities as well to to reach those uh, community groups that are actually making a change on the ground. Um, so hopefully those reflections are helpful. Um, I know that the SDGs kind of slightly at a different angle, but hopefully it just helps to strengthen that um, broad push from civil society to, uh, to push back against the nationalism and repression that we see in so many parts of the world. So thank you again, uh, and look forward to the further debate. Okay, thank you very much, Oli. Uh, you highlight the importance of SDG in relation to democracy. In fact, it was a session yesterday, Democracy SDG through SDG 16. 
as you may know, uh, we are doing this uh, people's book. Uh, hopefully, you know, as you know, we have a two global report, the state of democracy and then civic civic monitoring. Hopefully, uh, within few years, uh, FOSD have, can produce a people's scorecard uh, as we 16 and as we general, you know, so that we can have a more the data for our advocacy and monitoring. Thank you very much once again. So now let's from these two global, we are going ground, you know, which is a hot spot. Now India, the cause to please uh, let us know what's happening and then how we can do together about India and also uh, globally. You know? Okay, cause to you have a PowerPoint, right? Yes, please. Right, right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Anselmo. Uh, um, uh, greetings to all of you from uh, a very sick, uh, sad and gloomy uh, India, uh, which is now experiencing uh, triple whammy. Uh, first, a large number of people are sick due to the severe uh, second wave of the pandemic. Um, along with the people, the economy is sick with increasing number of uh, unemployed people. Uh, and along with people and economy, the democratic governance, which is uh, today's discussion point uh, in the country is showing all kinds of morbidity. Um, so in this uh, presentation, uh, I would like to share how um, uh, in recent months, in fact, India's democracy is being uh, systematically pushed towards an irrecoverable uh, morbidity, particularly in the pandemic uh, time. Um, for your benefit, I work with an organization called Participatory Research in Asia, Priya. We are based in New Delhi, and for the last 40 years, we have been promoting civilian participation in democracy, <coughs> development, and governance. <clears throat> so, um, uh, after listening all three uh, excellent presentations, you know, I, I um, find a lot of resonance uh, in, in terms of um, you know, when the Civicus presentation talked about 10 violations of civic freedom, uh, you will find elements of all those uh, violations in my uh, presentations. And, and, and there are cases where uh, all these uh, are reflected. Um, and, and one of the things that I uh, also concur after listening to all three presentations is uh, there was a kind of, you know, pre-pandemic disposition uh, where the democratic, democratic deficits were already there, which have now uh, aggravated uh, during the pandemic. And because of the governance decisions, uh, it has uh, uh, led to a kind of you know, grave uh, situation. So, um, the, and, and, and there are sort of different tactics that the governments are now using uh, to curtail the voice uh, and choke the uh, voices of the most uh, marginalized. And one of the things that they are doing is hiding information. And this has become almost like a hallmark uh, of India's uh, current governance system. Um, you know, uh, obfuscating, camouflaging, promotion of lie, increasingly becoming the hallmark. Um, as of today, just to give you example, um, as per the official record, over 250 million people have been uh, contracted con uh, coronavirus. Um, and almost like uh, uh, 287,000 people have died of this virus. However, there is sort of widespread belief that the actual number could be double and the government is hiding uh, uh, the numbers. Uh, last month, in fact, you know, 200, uh, uh, eminent scientists uh, have written a letter to the prime minister to share the clinical data uh, allegedly hoarded by the Indian Council of Medical Research, which sets the kind of health policies for the uh, government. And this data was critical to all kinds of you know, COVID-related re re uh, research and modeling uh, for the pandemic. Um, you know, at the beginning of this year, uh, India received um, enormous accolades from the international community uh, because of its uh, vaccine maitri uh, program uh, under which it shared 
uh, over 63 million uh, of COVID vaccine uh, to almost like 95 countries. Um, however, the domestic uh, vaccination policy uh, has been uh, receiving severe criticism from various sections and particularly in relation to its pricing policy. As of now, um, you know, we have two uh, main producers, uh, Siram in India Institute and, and Bharat Biotech. And the government has allowed these uh, two producers to fix price, one for the central government, one for the state government, which is obviously higher or, or double uh, the amount that the central government would purchase or procure, uh, and then the third for the uh, private hospital. So it's quite ridiculous to see that one country, two producers, three kind of pricing. Uh, so that's the kind of you know, policy which the government is now uh, uh, pursuing. The, the second sort of hallmark, if I uh, may say, and, and, and uh, in the Civicus presentation, it was also uh, mentioned as one of the uh, areas of concerns is the governance by intimidation. Uh, and with the, with the second wave of pandemic, uh, the when the demand for oxygen, medicine, hospital-based uh, sold up, um, as the number of COVID patients uh, surged and the entire health system almost collapsed, uh, and in an absentee state, it's the citizens or the civil society groups who supported uh, each other. Uh, the Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp uh, became the means of communication. But unfortunately, in one of the states, uh, in, the, in the northern part of India called Uttar Pradesh, uh, the government shamefully declared that there is no shortage of oxygen, medicine, or hospital beds, uh, and people are spreading uh, rumor and fake news, um, and, and in an attempt to, to malign the government. And people will be booked by the police uh, for spreading this misinformation. Uh, and it was not an empty threat. And, and actually, the police filed <clears throat> several uh, first information reports against the ordinary citizens, all they were trying to do is to arrange oxygen or medicine for their dying relatives uh, and, and friends by calling uh, <clears throat> and, and, and informing other, other, other uh, friends. Um, and as the entire, entire government seemed to have disappeared, uh, people started you know, criticizing the government openly on uh, social media. Uh, and, and you know that you know, there's a kind of vibrant social media netizens uh, 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 present in India. Uh, the only thing the central government could think of uh, to curb this criticism was to ask uh, you know, social media platforms like Twitter <clears throat> to take down tweets which were critical of government's handling of COVID-19 situation. And this is not a, an isolation, uh, isolated act of the government. This has been consistent that over the years, there have been, that the government has been putting pressure on the social media platforms to take down the post which have been critical of the, of the government. Uh, now, you, all of you might be knowing that in 2021, the World Press Freedom Index uh, produced by the Reporters Without uh, Borders uh, has placed India uh, at 142nd uh, rank out of 180 countries for the second time. Uh, uh, so in that sense, there is a consistency uh, uh, that, that India is maintaining. 142nd for the second time out of 180 countries. So in the year 2020, um, uh, approximately, uh, I, may, I may be wrong with the numbers, but, the, but the, uh, uh, some of the sources uh, indicated that 67 journalists were arrested, uh, detained, questioned in India for their work. And most also, of them. I'm sorry, uh, you have only two minutes left. Instead of describing, just okay. the key point. Okay, okay. I'll try to sort of you know, con uh, uh, conclude uh, this. And, and, and most of them have been charged with the terror or sedition activities, while others were harassed through a number of uh, uh, defamation. Uh, and, and meanwhile, you know, trolling uh, by, by the Hindu to bikers, you know, continue on uh, social media on the secular forces. Uh, the, six, the, the second and you know, third sort of you know, strategies or tactics that the government is using uh, is co-opting institutions. You know, one of the institutions, election commissions of India, which, was, um, which has been uh, 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 you know, highly respected 
uh, institutions for its neutrality um, and 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 uh, you know managing a large scale elections in India, starting from the general elections, also the uh, state assembly uh, uh, elections. But of late, there has been allegations that the election commission is uh, commission of India is working in favor of the uh, ruling party. So much so that um, you know when uh, with with the surge of this pandemic. Uh, the election continued in five uh, uh, states, and and there's political campaigns, political rallies. All these were continuing um, because the elections uh, were held in these five uh, five states. So one of the high courts, uh, Madras or Chennai High Court, um, you know, termed the election commission as murderer, and the election commissions then appealed to the Supreme Court to get to pass a gag order uh, on on the journalists. Uh, and this, so we have only one minute left, please. I'll, I'll just, um, I have just one more slide. Um, and, and then widespread use of national investigation agencies, CBIs, and enforcement directors uh, against any, any critic. Um, and in the face of all of these, uh, you know, the, the, the government has abandoned this uh, responsibility and, and prematurely and announcing that COVID is behind us. Um, and, and this declaring this triumph was too early. And uh, because most of them relied on the tamed bureaucrats and the inner political circles without uh, uh, you know, uh, listening to the scientists and the, and the ex experts. Uh, on top of that, you know, it allowed to, um, you know, a, 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 a massive religious gathering to happen uh, where almost like, you know, 7 million people uh, uh, participated. So these became a kind of uh, super spreader uh, in, in, in uh, uh, all of the COVID. And lastly, you know, uh, there has been consistent effort of suppressing dissents and civil society, uh, which have been sort of demonstrated through the protest against uh, Citizenship Amendment Act or National Register of Citizens, uh, maligning the voices of the farmers when they are protesting against the farm law and then also ignoring the voices of the trade unions when they prepared the uh, labor code in 2020. And lastly, you know, choking resources to civil society through Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Act, despite the stellar role that civil society organizations have been playing last year and this year as well. So thank you so much, Anselmo, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, let me stop here. OK, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I was so sorry, uh, I couldn't give more time. As you know, the, India is not only largest democracy, but it's the founding member of community of democracy. It played a key role to, for the promotion. But last several years, we hear you know, very sad news uh, over and over again. So now it's uh, one of the most dangerous countries in the world you know, in terms of COVID-19. So how our civil society can continue to work to rebuild democracy from this edge and China. Okay, so let's continue. Now we go to Asia. The Sima is leaving uh, soon. So uh, is it okay, Sima? After, I want to uh, give you the, the chance to speak after Sue. Okay, so, and then the Professor Park will speak after you. Okay, Sue, you have uh, seven minutes, please. Oh, thank you. It, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, fantastic. Um, hi, thank you for this opportunity um, to speak. It's a privilege to be amongst all of you. Uh, my name is Sue. I'm the program manager at the Asia Democracy Network. And I, I think simply put, um, as a response to the uh, Civicus and IDEA uh, presentations, uh, we agree. Uh, we, as a advocacy uh, network in Asia, we feel uh, this uh, decline in democracy. Uh, we have been responding to it. Um, uh, and uh, we definitely are feeling it to the bone, uh, this definite regress in democracy. Um, we are a network of network. Um, we have 10 network organizations, uh, such as Forum Asia, UNFRAL, um, and uh, over 300 national organizations under our umbrella network. Uh, we do uh, democracy promotion um, and democracy, defend democracy across Asia um, through interdisciplinary uh, topics and um, advocacy campaigns. So um, as you all know, in 2019, 2020, it was a year of protests um, that was leaderless 
and uh, of a struggle that was uh, raged across not only in Asia, but across the whole world. Uh, but mostly um, just to highlight a few countries in Asia, Hong Kong, Thailand, India, and uh, in the Philippines, uh, we've seen a people's, uh, very organic people's movement uh, responding to this regress. And, and on a positive note, I guess, you know, seeing these people's movements emerge, it's a good sign um, that, you know, people, regular uh, folks are more interested in issues and are becoming more engaged in the political process. So I guess, you know, just to find the silver lining, we could, you know, see the positives of that. Um, but I think the fundamental, um, you know, fundamental worrying concern is, you know, we're seeing these rise of populist leaders that are democratically elected um, and we're seeing, uh, it, because of that, we're seeing, uh, you know, their characteristics and how they manipulate institutions um, and, uh, and seeing how that uh, dangerously declines democratic values and principles um, is becoming a high concern. And, and we're seeing because at least not only in the region, but across the world, uh, there are at least uh, new democracies or emerging democracies have very weak democratic institutions. You know, they're very vulnerable to these populist leaders, uh, which is why uh, we're seeing such a steep decline. Um, they're using, uh, and we're seeing this trend of legal, using the legal means, um, judicial, the judiciary branches um, uh, to weaponize, um, weaponizing them and using them to strip uh, democratic values and human rights. Um, just for example, in Cambodia, we saw a Supreme Court, um, you know, rule against to dissolve the biggest uh, opposition party, um, you know, and broad interpretations of laws across Asia to crack down specifically and very focused on media actors and activists. Um, and as a clear example of that is the Philippines, who ruled um, to shut down one of their biggest uh, news networks, ABS, CBN and also to a, uh, prosecute uh, the biggest, um, the vocal um, journalist, uh, Maria Ressa of Rappler. Um, and of course, as we saw in the uh, presentations, the pandemic exasperated these trends um, and in the name of public health, it gave an opportunity for a lot of these leaders to uh, further restrict civic space. Um, and uh, we, and just to kind of, um, of course, Idea and uh, Civic has clearly uh, showed uh, that trend, um, but also I just wanted to also uh, introduce our Asia Democracy Chronicles, uh, which is a, uh, our online media platform. Uh, we reach out to uh, activists, media actors, journalists on the ground specifically to uh, write for us and um, gives us stories about what's really happening on the ground how COVID-19 has affected uh, their civil liberties and human rights. Uh, so as you see on your screen, this is our Asia Democracy Chronicles um, site. Uh, you can see many of uh, the articles uh, written for us by these actors. And um, I think the pandemic uh, media actors were the most hit. Uh, they um, you know, lost, we have a lot of journalists, local journalists losing their jobs. And uh, through this uh, was a very good opportunity to engage them and um, kind of also assist them in getting through the pandemic. And um, through our, we've been doing this um, uh, media platform for about a year and a half now. And um, it goes, it, it's definitely not statistics or data based, but it really reflects the people to people stories. And um, we really were able to see the regress of democracy and human rights um, in amidst the pandemic and how it directly impacted them. Um, media actors um, were directly affected. Freedom of uh, media space, uh, very uh, restricted. And most of all, we were able to kind of see the, how, you know, before the pandemic, you know, we always uh, talked about the un, uh, inequality, uh, economic, social gap. But I think through the pandemic, uh, we felt exactly uh, and more uh, more clearly what that is because we saw so many vulnerable populations um, not able to have access to basic health care education and decent working conditions uh, because of the pandemic, uh, which was clearly indicated through a lot of the articles and stories that we received on our platform. 
um, I, I think I, I'll just close and um, just, you know, uh, just to say that, yes, also on the regional level, we affirm, we confirm the findings of Civic and Idea, but, you know, what I, a question I want to put out there for this group, because I feel like there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, great organizations, and of course, uh, we have Professor Parker too, and, you know, yesterday we had a uh, discussion uh, session on uh, democratization movements in Asia and South Asia and, and East Asia, and I posed the question, I said, you know, Korea is looking to, um, you know, possibly pass a uh, bill so that they could develop a uh, democracy fund to assist more uh, democracy uh, activists, more uh, human rights issues in the region. Um, you know, what is, and not only Korea, but what, I, I pose the question to them, what more can we do to have political will from a lot of these dem democ uh, democracy champion governments in Asia? not only Korea, Japan, India, Indonesia, what kind of, uh, what can we do more to have them be more active and not only release statements when, it, when, um, when uh, things like Myanmar happen, but what they could do through policy, you know, what, you know, such as uh, they, you know, Korea, Japan, and all these countries, they could create uh, mechanisms to provide safe harboring for a lot of uh, political asylum seekers or refugees, like, which we'll see a lot more of from Hong Kong and Myanmar. And it was uh, interesting, their response was, it's, I don't think, they're, they're not optimistic. They're like, a lot of these governments in this region won't do anything. So um, I think, so I wanted to repose that question to this group. What more can we do as advocates um, to encourage a lot of these countries? Because I feel like, um, response, government response from Asian countries to these issues is a lot more powerful than always the Western ones at the moment, especially in this region. So um, that I'll just end it at that and see uh, if we can discuss that further. Thank you. Okay, thank you so very much. Uh, your, and also posing the important question. Probably maybe Sima, uh, maybe you can also answer this question because uh, as you know, the Myanmar, you know, everyday people are getting killed and the UN failed to take a uh, action. And we have the two international organizations on democracy, community democracy and also international idea. Uh, what can we do, you know, on concrete issues? People are asking for R2P responsibility to protect, you know, so in this issue. Okay, so since we have another meeting, Sima, could you please give us your response to those uh, discussions first? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, I am not going to pretend that I can answer a question about political will, but I will say that this is obviously a problem everywhere, um, not just in Asia, this issue of political will. And it's something that we at IDEA have thought about as well. And I think part of the answer might lie in figuring out how to incentivize leaders to, um, to do these, the, to, you know, to, to take this viewpoint. So how can we make it worth it, basically, for them? To, to do this. And I think part of the answer to that question lies in changing the sort of infrastructure we have to that, that undergirds our democracies. So what can we change in those structures to have leaders that are more willing to take a stand and also al allow leaders that take those stands to then feel like they have benefited from what they've done and then serve as models for other leaders around the world. And I think um, one sort of one opening I see is to encourage the adoption of electoral systems that, that um, incentivize moderation. So there's an academic debate about you know, whether proportional representation systems are better or whether centripetal systems are better. And centripetal systems are ones that like I said, incentivize um, leaders to take moderate positions, right? So for example, if you have a ranked, um, a ranked voting system where voters can say, this is my first choice, but actually this is my second and third choice also, then what ends up happening is that the, the politicians will look, right? To see, they wanna appeal not only to their base, which is gonna rank them first, 
but they also want to appeal to whoever might rank them second because in the vault counting, if you don't get enough ones, then they go to your number twos, right? And so when you have to appeal beyond your base, it, autom it forces you to be moderate in your position. And then when you get enough elected leaders like that into office, you will automatically have a very different group of people and a very different like vision for what you want your country to look like and what you want your region to look like. And the other thing I've thought about is just in terms of political office, this is a very kind of pie in the sky dream, but if we could create structures that that don't present political office as something that um, allows you to make a lot of money or comes with a ton of perks, then you're going to get people running for office that actually genuinely want to, to engage in public service and not people who are in it for um, more selfish reasons, right? If public office didn't come with perks and immunity and fancy cars and housing allowances, you wouldn't get the same crop of people running for election. And, and then again, if you get enough of those, then you would have a very different face of uh, countries would have leaders that have very different faces. Um, so I realize both of those things are require many, many steps and many years. But I think if we start to look at structural incentives, um, that could be one way forward. Um, and I want to apologize for having to leave for my other meeting and to thank you very much for inviting us to this forum. Um, and we would be very happy and look forward to participating in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sima, for taking your time to be with us. Okay, let's continue our discussion. Now, may I invite uh, Professor uh, Park to share your view on this uh, presentation and also discussion. You have about uh, seven uh, minutes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this so tiny, so meaningful topic and session under the, how can I say, the global pandemic disaster and global tragedy. Yes, uh, we must try to find a, some sort of window to hope and recovery for the whole humankind, who are the whole planetary, how can I say, um, the situations. Yes, uh, um, generally, I agree with the perspectives and presentations and some suggestions of the presenters and the discussants. Um, through my discussion, I'd like to propose uh, some sort of combination or interconnected way of uh, recovery. Uh, I think there are two dimensions of current uh, crisis of democracy. Some of the theorists are using the word of, yes, uh, democratic, as Sima said, democratic erosion or democratic decline, democratic crisis, or some of the serious are democratic demise, democratic death, democratic suicide, including John Keane and Mark Chu. They are using the word of democratic suicide. suicide. Okay, okay. Democracies killed themselves democratically. Democracies killed themselves democratically. Then I think the first of all, after the demise of a socialist bloc, the, the global society, global community lost the opportunity, I think. At the time, the sharp polarization of economy and sharp polarization of the wealth, sharp polarization of the world yes yeah, showed in front of us then democracy basically yes found on the condition of middle class economy middle class capitalism or middle class um polity middle class constitution but 
from that time, we are seeing, we could see the rich people democracy, millionaire democracy, or billionaire democracy. Now, right after the crisis of COVID-19, we can see the trillionaire democracy, so-called the new extremes of democracy. How can survive? How can survive under this kind of, yes, extremely polarized situation? How can the democracy survive? Unfortunately, after the, yes, globalization era, the unprecedented, unexpected pandemic situation came. And then, as President has said, the state of emergency, state of crisis, state of repressive control, yes, and in front of us. The most important problem being from my perspective is the situation of the vulnerabilities, the vulnerable, pe vulnerable people under the pandemic situation. Now, the humankind, the global community need a new great deal with them, with the vulnerable people, including the poor people, minorities, and many jobless people. The inequality situation under the yes pandemic situation is getting worse, even right after the yes globalization period. Then I think the new great deal with, with the vulnerable people is a so, some sort of category imperative of the whole humankind. Second thing is uh, now under the pandemic situation, we must not single out. We must not choose just one thing of the tools, private information, pri protection of private information, private freedom, privacy, or to increase the public health, public safety. How to protect both of the two things simultaneously? How to increase? the private freedom and public health simultaneously. That's one of the most important tasks in front of the whole humankind. As I said, we must not single out just one of the two things. The, thing, the, thing, the two things are, yes, most emergent and important, especially to the vulnerable social groups vulnerable economic groups. Final one is, I think, um, yes, all things that you already said. Um, after entering the age of pandemic COVID-19 situation, we moved from the age of company, age of market, age of money, age of billionaire. Now we are under the situation of age of state, Again, state control, surveillance, organization, okay, AI or pandemic, panopticon situation. Then those prospect for the short-term future is not optimistic, as you said, as you said, it's very pessimistic. How to check, how to control the state power and the big tech, big company, Again, because economic social polarization is getting worse, isolation and weakness of the vulnerable people getting worse and getting more vulnerable. Power of technology, power of big company, power of surveillance organization is getting stronger. My tentative answer is to organize, to participate, to make a solidarity again, the civic groups or civic initiatives, uh, civic power from below. This is very simple and very old answer. Without make those kind of solidarity participation initiative 
from below, I think no one can find any proper answer or solution to this kind of this unprecedented disaster. Yes, the problem is new, but the solution or the answer is so old and already given. That's my so humble and tentative um, answer. Thank you so much for inviting me again. Thanks. Hey, thank you, uh, Professor Park. I think I was shocked to hear the word democratic suicide. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about crisis, but when you say the suicide, I think it's a real meaning, you know, because democracy, we have established institutions, norms, and so but we did not practice, you know. So finally, we are killing the old institutions we have created, you know, at uh, all costs. So this really alarming, you know, and also reminds us um, challenges are new, but we already have an answer, you know, how to, as Sue said, you know, how to translate all blah blah into concrete action on the ground, you know. So that should be the, the basis for our reaction. Thank you very much for your input. And now I'd like to invite Ine uh, from Civic uh, After listening to five uh, discussions, I want, I'm very curious how you see, you know, because your report's title was very interesting, People Power on the Attack. You know? And you said that there's some positive, but not very positive. And generally the picture is not very bright, you know. So, uh, Ine, do you have a, can you share your insight, how we can do together to reverse this trend? And then I will also ask everybody to give a one minute, you know, complete about the takeaway, you know, before we close the session. Ine, are you? I'm Salma, I think she has left. Oh, uh, she's not in the okay. She has left. Okay, maybe some technical problem. Okay, so then no problem. So can you begin with the Patricia? Can you give us your takeaway and then kind of concrete remarks before we close? <laughs> Thank you, Anselmo. Well, it's, um, you know, I wish uh, we had had more of a positive um, conversation and, and it seems that, uh, you know, it's a reality of what we have mm. at this moment. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we saw it with uh, the presentation that Civicus gave, of course, and their monitoring of COVID-19 and then what Civ uh, you know, Civicus presented and International Idea presented. So it, it, it certainly, you know, presents a very bleak peach, uh, picture of what we have right now currently, not only in Asia, of course, as was mentioned by other by other friends, but in the entire world, I mean, and the, with the decline of democracy and everything else. But I think if we need to see still the silver lining of, um, you know, there's still participation of civil society, I think, at, and that's an, an important silver lining to consider that there are still open spaces. Uh, we have seen, I can't remember who, which of the speakers mentioned this, but it's very true, we saw, even back in 2019 and then in 2020, so many protests and so many movements happening. Uh, and so even if there has been decline, and certainly there has been a decline in the quality of democracy, and then, but there has also been those, you know, windows of opportunities that have all of a sudden presented themselves. And so I think it's very important to note that, that there's still people on the ground that there are still, you know, these, yes, there are challenges, but there's still the opportunities that we need to take advantage of and that we need to certainly support. Um, you know, I think uh, we mentioned before uh, in one of the countries is the Gambia, Armenia had, you know, it's velvet revolution. And then there were some problems, you know, back last year. And, uh, but I think we need to continue supporting these uh, countries that are in transition. So this is something very important to do. And then civil society, of course, and I mentioned civil society as we work with the community hand in hand with civil society, we, uh, there are a very important uh, pillar that we have. And, and certainly um, we continue to promote them and to, um, you know, look at ways to enable, enable civic space by actually leading by example, I think, uh, as the community of democracies. And um, just going back maybe to something that um, 
that's to uh, her question, the question that she posed, which I really don't even know how to answer. And it's so hard to, 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 to talk about political will. And, and that's, you know, it, it, that's the, a, a very hard, hard question. How can we, you know, how can we push? How can uh, there be changes maybe through policies and not only providing, you know, statements or declarations? And I, I completely agree with that. And I think one way um, will be to just continue to promote this dialogue and common action between these countries, between these supporters of democracy, between these um, you know, leaders that can just uh, take that flag and, and really lead by example. And I think that's something that we try to do as a community of democracies. And I know we will continue to do that. And, and in doing so, the other thing will be and the other important thing is to continue to to talk to all the stakeholders, of course, like we're doing right now, to engage in a meaningful, not only a dialogue, but I would say a meaningful dialogue with civil society. Patricia, can you wind up? Because we, we have only five minutes left for other speakers. All right. Thank you very much. So let's move to the only. Have a one minute takeaway. Thanks, Anselmo. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've seen some pretty uh, devastating trends in the world. Uh, I'm particularly struck by Karstov's uh, presentation on some of the very specific tactics that we're seeing from autocrats and oligarchs around the world. Um, and unfortunately, we're living in a time where those kind of autocrats are learning bad practices from each other instead of us being able to share the good practices. And some of the tactics that I think Kalstov described in India, we've also seen in Russia, in Hungary, in fact, even in the UK. I mean, the misinformation, the use of deliberate misinformation is a key characteristic of the Johnson government in the UK right now. And that's how they got the Brexit vote through, uh, potentially with Russian uh, funding behind them as well. So it's really quite uh, shocking to see that this has become somehow the norm um, and that there are clearly corporate interests behind all of those regimes that are deliberately exploiting the world. Many of those linked to the fossil fuel industry. We know that they don't want people to speak out. That's why they kick Greenpeace out of India. Um, it's very, very clear that it's the corporate interest and those corporate interests also come back to Europe and to North America. So I don't think anyone is inside this and we need to stand together to push back against a very concerted effort by those oligarchs to restrict uh, and exploit uh, resources across the planet. So I do feel it's a very important time for us to work together. Um, hopefully it is a cycle, as you say, uh, Anselmo, that can be reversed. Um, I mean, when I was a child, I was growing up in Brazil in the 80s, and my parents were very involved in the fight against the military dictatorship at that time. Um, and so hopefully we will also have the same uh, success in overcoming um, these autocrats in the coming uh, decade. Um, and I think the world needs it, you know, and that's why as A4SD, we certainly will be working in solidarity, uh, pushing for what we've termed a great recovery that is healthy, green and just, uh, and that really embeds um, principles of sustainability and social justice um, as part of this plan for the coming decade. Um, I suppose a, a glimmer of hope is coming from the Biden administration, where they seem to be taking on board some of these principles, um, whether or not they can push strongly enough and whether they can bring other countries with them, I guess remains to be seen. But uh, it's certainly a critical moment. So thank you again, Anselmo. Okay, okay thank you. So, Kostu, uh, please. Well, thank you, Anselmo, and thank you, Sue, for asking these very pertinent questions. I was quite sort of intrigued with these uh, question. I think Sima was trying to give a kind of technocratic solution to the political organization and political governance and how um, this can sort of, you know, improve the situation. To my mind, we, we need to have a kind of combined bottom-up and top-down uh, uh, strategies. Continue to protest, dissent, um, and talk against the repressive policies. Um, and encouraging the citizens organization, civil society groups to do so. But the second part is, is, is more important. You know, it's kind of arrogance of the government and the shameless dumping of international monitoring reports uh, and saying that they are self-appointed and we don't care about those reports. But when they get the report from the World Bank that ease of business doing, uh, ease of doing business, 
uh, and the you know sort of India's sort of rate goes up, then the government will be sort of you know come up to it, tom tom uh, uh, all, all these all these achievements. So what might be useful is to have a, a kind of friendly dialogue with the with the current regime by the friendly government. Uh, not in a public uh, dialogue, but perhaps in a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, 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 you know, advice that what might happen uh, if you don't take care of democracy, if you don't take care of human rights, the kind of international image that you are creating that might eventually affect your economic progress and, and overall prosperity of the society. So that kind of dialogue might be, and, and, and I hope that community of democracy kind of uh, platforms uh, can play a meaningful role because they have a shared uh, 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 platform. And lastly, I, 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 uh, I leave with uh, all this hope that, uh, you know, it's a kind of cyclic, um, this, this side days would go uh, and we'll, we'll see a more vibrant democracy uh, where civil society and citizens group can flourish. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you, Kastu. Yep, so pressure through dialogue, you know. Can be one of the options. Okay, so please, you raise occasion, could you please answer. <laughs> I mean, I can't answer it. That's why I posed it to you. <laughs> no, but I, I think um, I totally agree with Kostov. I, I, I think now, um, even for us as ADN, we really need to start engaging uh, like minded governments and have this dialogue and really kind of um, inform them and engage them with what's going on so that pressuring to be to have more political uh, will um, to respond uh, a little bit more better during these situations and and also and Ali made a very good point about a lot of these private corporations right a lot of their influence um, affects our government the way our government acts and they compromise democratic Credit values and human rights sometimes uh, because of corporate interest. And that's definitely something we really need to start working on as well. So I guess my takeaway is we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I guess in a sense, it's, um, you know, it's job security, but then at the same time, it's a lot of work. So, uh, but it's great to, you know, be here and with uh, all of you and, you know, hopefully we could, you know, work a little bit closely together to kind of get this type of um, advocacy across um, the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Professor Park, you talk about suicide, but you need to talk about resurrection now. <laughs> <laughs> um, on on the, this kind of crisis of the whole world, I think this kind of dialogue is a token of, I think, our struggle or our solidarity, okay, our okay, um, endeavor. Uh, for recovery of the democracy. Then, as Anselmo promised, uh, next year, we hope we all get together in Guangzhou or any other city. Okay. He, he is a person who keeping his promise. Um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, almost all of the regimes uh, usually they prefer to continue and maximizing the abnormal state of emergency, abnormal state of exception uh, for yielding the power, for controlling the people, then I think we need to monitor so sharply, so keenly the situations of the okay, uh, ordinary people and everyday life of the uh, vulnerable, vulnerable peoples and also so strongly urge the struggle for the recovery of the normal practice, normal value, uh, normal norms of democracy uh, for both, uh, for both uh, our individual freedom and human rights and also the whole healthy state of democracy and the world. Uh, that's how to combine these two things is the, I, I think, um, the um, duty uh, of us as a humankind. Yes, yes thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Professor Park. Um, okay, I really hope to meet all of you again next year in Guangzhou with uh, good news, you know. 
of course, situation is very challenging. So hopefully we can, uh, so that we can empower each other for better future. And also tomorrow, there will be a closing session of Bangu Democracy Forum. All your idea we put into not decorate. We are not going to adopt another decoration, you know, but agenda for action, you know. Mm. We share with you the all the uh, compiled uh, ideas and proposal for action, so that we can continue to um, uh, to work together. So thank you very much for your participation. So let's give a big hand to everybody. Thank you so and much. Hope to see you. Keep safe. All right. Thank you. Bye thank bye. You. Bye. Thanks, thanks again. Thanks. Bye. Bye thank bye. You.